Muito bom dia a todas e todos. A gente vai iniciar agora a primeira rodada de falas do, seminários, do Seminário Afro-Atlânticas. Um, nossos seminários funcionam, cada, cada convidado tem mais ou menos 30 minutos para falar. Depois de 30 minutos, nós abrimos para as perguntas. As perguntas do público são feitas por escrito, para a organização interna, e porque o seminário também é traduzido do inglês para o português e vice-versa. Então, nós pedimos, por favor, que escrevam as perguntas com letra legível e em português, é, no, e entreguem para os nossos funcionários em preto, que estão circulando pelo auditório, durante as falas. Eles têm papel, algum deles tem caneta, se vocês precisarem. É, gostaria de convidar e dar as boas-vindas aqui ao Tumelo Moussaka, nosso primeiro palestrante. O Tumelo vai apresentar uma mesa chamada Reflexões Passadas e Novas Perspectivas, uma nota curatorial. Tumelo Moussaka é curador independente de Joanesburgo, África do Sul. Baseado nos Estados Unidos há mais de duas décadas, trabalhando dentro e fora de museus, sua pesquisa curatorial se estende para além dos campos interdisciplinares da prática artística contemporânea, com foco na cultura visual da África e da diáspora. Seus projetos curatoriais incluem Turning Tide, do Memorial Act Museum, em Guadalupe, Andrew Light, Full Circle, do Dorsky Art Museum, em Nova York, 2016, Poetic Relations, do Paris Art Museum, em Miami, em 2015, e a primeira edição da Bienal Internacional de Arte Contemporânea, da Martinica, em 2014. Atuou ainda como curador de arte contemporânea do Cranert Art Museum, em Urbana Campaign, no Illinois, onde foi responsável pela curadoria de várias exposições. Atualmente, Moussaka é curador-chefe da Cape Town Art Fair, em 2018, no ano que vem. Então, Moussaka, por favor, gostaria de pedir que você suba aqui. Muito obrigada. Bom dia. I want to first um, to start by thanking Adriano and uh, Lily Schwartz for the invitation to join you today. Thank you again. So my talk today, I'm going to focus just on a few projects, well, very few projects that I've done um, in thinking about this topic of uh, histories from the African diaspora. Um, in a lot of my work, I've really, you know, what has really been an important aspect has been this notion of context, the, the idea of placemaking and the idea of thinking about what it means to be in a particular moment, in a particular place and the politics that surround that space. And so uh, in thinking about what to do today, I, I had to go back to one of my early projects, which um, was the, really the engine behind uh, me really becoming a curator um, whilst I was still living in South Africa and thinking about what my life was going to be like. And um, this project um, that I will start to show you really stemmed from being you know, growing, growing up under apartheid in South Africa and trying to think about what culture means in a repressed society. How does one, you know, find a voice? And how does one um, engage in a conversation beyond just uh, the limited means that the government was allowing? And so art was a way for me to not only express myself, but really to communicate with other people beyond my immediate family and friends, how to think about you know, marking time, but also marking special moments in life that mean something to either myself or my family and community. And so in 96, um, I was invited to consider, um, I was invited to consider uh, developing a project that would mark Oh, sorry, let me just go back. I haven't started my slides. Oh, okay, there. So just in terms of context, I grew up in a place called Soweto, very large dormitory city in South Africa with a population of about three to four million at that time, but now it's probably double. And um, didn't really go to museums, didn't know what museums were. But at this time in 96, um, well, actually in 76, there was a huge riot that happened, uh, a student riot, which took place. And um, unfortunately, a lot of young people were killed and arrested. And so in 96, uh, this was two decades since this event had happened. And the question at the table was, 
you know, how was this history to be commemorated? It's in a, this, at this moment, it's a new democracy in South Africa. And of course, the question of history in terms of who is writing the history, who does it represent, and where is it being disseminated, became an issue. And so while the politics, while well, politics was trying to define, redefine, structure, uh, a new way of thinking and learning, culturally, we were also trying to figure out how to find new spaces, how to bring in the new voices, how to intervene in the structure that actually exists within the South African context. As a young man then, I was very revolutionary, I think, I'd like to think at least, and um, decided that I was not interested in re enforcing the current status quo in terms of participating in what existed already structurally. I wanted to find myself creating something different. And in that difference, especially having grown up in that time and having experienced the revolt, I wanted something that was going to happen within the context of Soweto. So my proposal to the powers that be was to really um, to do an exhibition, at what I thought was an exhibition, in the community that was involved in the struggle. And initially, I had no clue in terms of what I would do. I just knew that I needed to do something in the community. And for whatever reason, um, you know, they, they decided that to take a risk on me since I think the politics of the time were such that a lot of things were pretty open. There was a lot of fluidity in terms of thinking about uh, how to begin to readdress the political status quo culturally, how to rewrite policies about culture and the function of culture in a society. And so uh, young people at the time were, you know, very much, uh, very much uh, had the opportunities to begin to develop new structures and to participate in this transformative uh, process, which was entirely a result of a negotiated settlement. And so uh, my proposal was really to occupy this site that you see here on the, on the, on the slide. Um, this little uh, plot of land in the center, this little island, is a memorial stone of the first victim that was killed in, in 76 riots, a 13-year-old boy who was shot by the police. And every year since that day, um, the people in the community in, this, in, in where I grew up, uh, we'd all congregate for maybe half an hour singing protest songs, and just reflecting on the day in terms of what happened. And so my idea was to really reactivate the site. For 20 years, this has remained the center point for 4 million people. And for me, living in a, in a, in a city that is so wealthy, you know, it struck a chord that you were the, with, a, with a city of 4 million people and this is what you have as a cultural, a cultural site of memorialization. How can we transform the space to something that can reflect the culture and the interest of all these people? And so I started to um, reimagine what my museum could be and came up with the idea of creating an exhibition in containers. And uh, the idea of containers came about because I was trying to imagine you know, a society that has no walls to put up art, a society that has no voice to celebrate its heroes, a society that is in constant, that used to be in con under constant surveillance, now has to re begin to reimagine what it wants and how the structures that be can reflect this history. But, you know, in terms of timing, um, one only has uh, what, is, what is allowed, um, and in that moment, I had three months to come up with a proposal and a concept and to execute. And so my only, my only re response was to really think about a temporal structure that could elevate the presentation of the works of artists that I was thinking about, but at the same time speak to the context, the fact that you know, the culture of this community was invisible. You know, the fact that the, 
the, the, the lack of uh, cultural spaces exists in this community. The fact that, um, you know, the history of this community is not even accessible. So how do I make this, as a curator or somebody who's been appointed to curate this experience, how do I do that? And um, I don't know what happened to my images. Uh, okay. Uh, I guess somebody else is controlling it. So anyway, I'll just, and so I, I, this exhibition was an exhibition which I was trying to also bring in a conversation between, you know, photographers who were present in the 76 riots, uh, who were documenting the, the atrocities that were committed by the, uh, the, the, the police force in conversation with the younger generation photographers who were, you know, photographing their communities and trying to tell a different story, a human story, because for a long time in South Africa at that moment was always about, you know, the oppression, the violence, the repression. But the human stories were things that were not being expressed, you know, the love, the hate, the, the sad, the joy, and the passion. And so I wanted to have that, that conversation between the hardcore journalistic images together with the, the more sort of compassionate, the more uh, real um, sort of um, docu uh, real essays by younger photographers. And so this experience really became something which I think the community responded very dearly because I think it was the first time in the history of this community where there was an actual um, initiative that reflected not only the pain and the loss, but also the love of the community. And within the first opening of the day, we had almost about five, 6,000 people attend the exhibition. And since that day, the show was meant to be on view only for, I think it was three months. The show was on view for at least four years. And this in itself spoke a lot in terms of the interest and the importance of history and whose history and who was telling the history and what kind of histories we were trying to express. And I think uh, what was important for me, I mean, I think at that time I didn't realize what I was doing. I had a passion to realize something. I had, I, I, I had a passion to, uh, I had access because I was working with a lot of photographers at the time. And I wanted to bring the two together to make a statement about the current moment, where we are today, to think about how we can begin to reimagine and actually begin to realize, you know, a, a different state of being. And so I think, you know, um, and by providing this access and by providing this opportunity for the community to engage, because I think it's important while we think about exhibitions and our histories and what these institutions like this museum mean, we always have to have the idea of audience in mind. Who are we talking to? Because who we talk to is also going to determine what we do in those institutions. So for me, it's always thinking about place, as I mentioned before, that it's not always about the structures. The structures are one thing, but it, it also matters where you are and what you do. And that's what, for me, is the basis of a lot of the work I do and where I operate. And the artists I work with are always, again, trying to make this connection between the personal and the public and then the community. Um, and so after four years of uh, being involved in this project, um, uh, what ultimately happens is that you begin to, to create a window of opportunity for people, especially people who are involved in, in, in I would say, more sort of power structures, people, decision makers, in, especially in government, to actually realize that the need and the importance of what needs to happen in, 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 the communi in certain communities is really to provide opportunities for new voices to really begin to flourish. And so after four years, this initiative of the new museum, what's now called the Hector Peterson M Museum, exists on that little island that you saw. That whole island was transformed into a cultural center and a museum that houses the history of that particular moment of 1976. So this is just one example of uh, one of the other, one, my initial project. And so from there then, obviously, I've traveled a lot and worked a lot in different places. But I want to come back to this, um, you know, I had the opportunity to live and work in, in the South Carolinas. And now the South Carolinas in the United States is considered to be the area where um, 
most of the slavery uh, happened. This is where all the plantations, this is where all the mainly, especially in this small town called Charleston where I lived, this is one of the, uh, one of the um, places where uh, a large part of the slaves that came to the United States came through South Carolina and Charleston. And so you begin to understand, well, um, you know, when looking at the landscape and trying to read, because I think it's so easy for us to just to take what we see as being the surface reality. And this is, again, this question of history, the layers of history. That for one, you know, we can think of history, the big history, which is the, 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 the history which tries to define who we are and what we are. But then when we begin to unpack that history, we begin to realize that there's many histories. You know, how are those many histories being represented or are being included in this larger conversation about history? And so in living in this town where, um, you know, it's a beautiful town, it's, it's on the coast, um, the weather is beautiful and the people are very friendly, but you begin to realize that so much remains unsaid about the city and town because the history of slavery is something that continues to be repressed. For one, you know, some people will say that, um, you know, the repression is also a result of centuries of, uh, you know, of grief because the history has not been acknowledged or hasn't been really directly addressed. And also for a lot of white Southerners, you know, there's also, because it's also a city which I think was um, involved in the Civil War and so between the North and the South, and so there is a sense that you know, the loss of the war, which meant that by losing the war they had to give up the ways of life, you know, is, is another sense of grief that on both the black and the white there is this sort of differences of types of grief, but the, the element of grief is one that sort of permeates the, sort of the, the landscape. And so as a curator coming into this context, somebody who's lived under apartheid to a, a different kind of apartheid, that exists, one that doesn't have many labels, but one in which when you touch the surface and you scrape the surface, you begin to realize that it's something that is, is deeper than you might imagine. And so, you know, I had to try to think about how do I investigate and how do I, you know, deal with this, 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 this relationship of histories and, uh, and, and the reemergence of this, um, well, not really reimagines, but I would say this 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 level of of of, of concealment, and 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 to quite a great degree a resentment. And so the artist, I I the one the project I worked on had to do with. Um, I realized immediately that it it needs to be about listening. That you know sometimes we're so quick to respond to what we think is happening, but when we take a moment to listen is actually, can become really informative in terms of what we can really realize. And so for the first year I spent listening to not only artists, but to listening to community and thinking about what is it that we can do together in terms of trying to realize a new kind of history for the city. What are the sort of language, what kind of language can we actually begin to bring into the public sphere to begin to unpack these different realities? And so the project was called Evoking History. And um, you know, after two years of working in the city, uh, you know, working sometimes with artists, working sometimes with local um, storekeepers or um, you know, um, you know, nurses, doctors, just in terms of thinking about what does it mean? What kind of memorials would you like to see in the city? You know, what are some of the issues at stake in terms of representation, you know? And, and whose history are we telling? You know, are we telling, is, it, is, you know, is the one history, one history carries more weight than the other? And how do we create a more um, inclusive kind of history? Or is it important that we do have this contestation between the different histories, since the space itself seems to be so loaded and so provocative. And so the artist I brought, um, the one on the, my right, uh, is a local artist living in, in, in the city. And he was interested in sort of defining to the public 
these moments in the landscape that, are, that sort of relate particularly to slave history. You know, you know, where when you look at the brochures of the city, in most cases, some of these spaces are not marked, so you never know what happened. So for instance, this is a, a big slave mark, a slave uh, market, which you know, the only thing that you can tell by is because it's written slave mart, but uh, you know, for the most part, it doesn't even exist in the brochures about the city. And so this little window frame would travel around the city, marking, you know, in some moments there'd be a tree that looks like just a normal tree, but this used to be a tree where a lot of hangings took place. Or, you know, a moment where uh, this used to be a whipping post that nobody no is not marked, but you know, is not spoken about. And through all this, you know, like I said, you know, uh, it, it involved a very intense conversation that took place on a weekly basis with different participants to a point where the picture on the right is a different artist. Um, uh, sorry, it's not even an artist, but it's an artisan. This was a craftsman who lives in the city and through these conversations was inspired to create a work that sort of responded to his particular immediate needs and histories uh, where in his community, a largely African-American community, uh, which was becoming gentrified, and he was witnessing families leave the community because they could no longer afford to live in the neighborhood, and those properties being demolished. And so this idea of absence, how absence can, um, how absence can represent something. You know, how do you, how do you uh, activate that space? And so one day he decided, you know, in order to make people aware of how these histories change and how the histories evolve and how we, we create our own histories that it was important for him to make a statement about these, the absence of history, the absence of community, you know. And he created this work which still sits there in this neighborhood on the south side of um, Charleston as a way to mark a moment in time and as a way to, 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 to state the absence of people who are now, you know, being displaced because of the economic uh, circumstances. In another project where, um, you know, it's always good to think from different positions and work with different artists from different places. And so I worked with this very interesting artist, Kim Suja, who's from Korea but lives in New York, um, who came to South Carolina, you know, to think about, you know, what it means to be an immigrant living in this place of immigrants, you know. And she was mostly interested in thinking about the geographical space, but from the water, that it's always, we're looking at the ocean from the land, but what does it look when we are, on, when we are in the ocean or on the ocean looking at the land? And this is what a lot of navigational, um, navigational um, pilots uh, do because for them the map is not about the land, it's about the water, it's about the currents, the flows. And this is how, you know, uh, sailors when they traveled, you know, from, from Europe to Africa, it's not only that they're looking for land, but it's also the reading the maps, it's all about the currents, the flows, you know. And so she was interested in how these, 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 these this, this decommissioned lighthouse, um, you know, as the sort of key to, uh, to bringing all these ships that came to this place called South Carolina, carrying all this cargo, both material and body, to this place to work on the plantations. And so since this is an over 100, 150 years old lighthouse, it had been decommissioned. Uh, it is, in a sense, another kind of marker in space and time in terms of the history of the city this, this lighthouse played a huge part in terms of how the development of the Americas, especially the South, came to be. And yet, it's an invisible history because it, has a, it had a function during its moment and now, after 150, 200 years, it no longer has a purpose because we have new gadgets and new things to, to mark space and time. And so she created this, this um, light um, lighting effect, which to a great extent was a way of sort of marking this, this, this ancient old uh, monument, you know, over time. And so what you would, what we'd see is that over time it would be like a breathe, it would breathe that it, 
every, I don't know, I think it was every 30, 30 seconds a minute, the color would change very slowly and gradually. You know, it was about giving body to something that seemed um, already, um, already useless. Okay, I'm gonna go faster because I think I'm gonna run out of time. And then another artist, uh, Neri Ward, who is Caribbean uh, from Jamaica, but uh, also lives in the United States. In terms of thinking about, you know, what, what immigrants brought, not only immigrants, but also what the, um, what the, um, you know, the, what we consider to be, you know, something that, 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 that is natural in the landscape. So for instance, if you take the, you know, the South of, Amer of America, Florida, the South Carolinas, you know, the symbol of the, the, the palm tree, you know, is something that gets always associated with the Caribbean and maybe in some parts of Brazil. Uh, but actually, this in the States, at least, it was imported. This was something that came from, yes, the Caribbean, but it was imported to a point where, because it grows everywhere and grows so well, that, you know, for most part, people consider it to be a natural, plant that, that, that has grown there. And so he's created a little a nursery made out of concrete and, uh, and steel and glass to point to this notion of the, the fragility of history and the fragility and fragility, but also the, 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 the tenacity uh, of how you know, these palm trees, even though they've come from elsewhere, have managed to survive and thrive in this new landscape, you know. And so in the, the, the notion of the fortress being again this, this idea of protection, this idea of, you know, trying to nurture something until it's, it's in this adult state, you know, in a way that um, it's actually, you know, in this case, you know, a way, a way of sort of drawing attention to the, to the sort of the, the, the contradiction, you know, between the, the steel and the glass you know, the fragility and the, 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 the sternness and the firmness and the concrete, which is again another material which, you know, um, to a great extent is supposed to last a long time. Um, but it is, you know, finding a way, finding a language to speak to these issues that are sometimes quite problematic. And as you see, it's placed in, a, in an open space uh, and this open space, again, is a piece of property which um, used to have a community around it. Uh, and, and it used to be largely African-American. Uh, because it's on the waterfront, uh, a lot of those people were displaced. And now this land is being used for development. Uh, and so putting this, this, this project on this particular property, again, raises these issues about, you know, what does it mean to actually have this, this you know, I think some people might think it's, it's crazy uh, uh, articulation of um, useless material in this, you know, open, very, very expensive land. But it is sort of trying to tease out and trying to position certain artworks in context which sometimes, you know, um, raise these questions about the economy of, uh, you know, objects, but also the, the transactions that happen between you know, ideas and, 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 and symbols that we associate very much with our everyday life. So, you know, moving from the, from the South and trying to think about, you know, places around the world and, you know, the politics that happen in our everyday life. Um, you know, I try a lot to think about, you know, the, this, this idea of monumentalization, if there's such a word, you know. And, and what these monuments mean, and artists who think about you know these these larger narratives about you know nationalism, and how they begin to become complicated when the histories have to change. So in this case, for instance, this is an artist from South Africa, Ladell, um, who's thinking about you know obviously there's a crisis right now in education, and um, you know you've probably heard fees must fall you know, monuments must fall, roads must fall. Uh, there's a whole revision about what's to happen to these monuments that, that permeate the landscape of South Africa, uh, and not only South Africa, and I think we've seen it in, the, in, in Eastern Europe and, uh, and are seeing it now in other places around the world. 
And so what happens when these monuments finally fall? What happens to the narratives? You know, because again, the narratives are very much entrenched in our educational systems, entrenched in our memory. How do we begin to shift that paradigm? You know, what does it take to do that? You know? And so these are some of the ideas and, and, and notions that I'm interested in in terms of thinking about you know, what these histories mean and how we begin to shift and change the language, how we begin to shift and change the way institutions think about these histories and try to represent them. Um, you know, another artist is uh, from Barbados, um, Jocelyn Gardner, who um, is interested in not only the, uh, the histories of, um, of slavery, but also the history of, it's sort of a, um, you know, thinking about how do you seduce and at the same time express the, the pain and the torture. You know, the seduction and the torture seem to be very sort of contra contrary, and, 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 but, but it's only through images that you're able to bring the two together in ways that they can coexist, but, you know, begin to sort of um, evoke a certain tension, you know, that even though they can't, they're not really supposed to coexist, but in terms of thinking about why they exist together, we can begin to sort of be unpack some of the relationships and the, and the strands that sort of begin to define what it means to be looking and thinking about these issues. So for instance, this case, uh, she's very much interested in, 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 in the sort of the history, the botanical history that was used by a lot of women during slavery in terms of how to protect themselves uh, from having, um, not so much to protect, to, to protect themselves from giving birth to unwanted kids. And so they, have the, they had the history and the knowledge of the different plants to use in order to, uh, to um, activate a kind of abortion. And so these plants that you see, you know, they're very sort of uh, abstractly uh, beautiful, but they're sort of connected to these torture tools that she's um, drawn or, 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 yeah, drawn. Um, and, and she's also using the head as a, as a, as a, as a, as a seat of uh, you know knowledge and beauty in which again drawing attention to the history of um, you know planning and embroidery that was brought that was part of the sort of African cultural heritage that a lot of uh, uh, slaves brought to the Americas, and I think I'm just going to go quickly because I just want to finish with one another artist who's dealing with like the, the photographic medium and thinking about how you know. The very apparatus that we use have also a history that everything seems to be tainted, that we can't use things with, without knowing what the, the, their histories are. So the, the very sense of like using, a, uh, this, is, this technique is called the umbrotype, which was a sort of a, a, ne a, a negative made into a positive uh, through the, the process of photography and focusing particularly on facial features, which was another way that was used uh, in order to um, create uh, identity kits of particular types of bodies. Um, and then finally, I want to end with this. this. This is the most recent project that I've been involved in, a public art project by Hank Thomas Willis, where, uh, again, you know, working in a community that is under threat of gentrification and thinking about how a community is constantly fighting not only economic and um, you know, challenges, but there's also the, the challenges of survival. And how do you bring hope to a community that is constantly under threat and fighting? And so uh, when working with this artist, bringing again certain symbols that might have some kind of um, you know, um, reference and thinking about you know, how you know, art can be a way in which to begin certain discussions about how, we can, how the community can begin to strategically work together to fight the threat that uh, is impending. And so finally, I think I want to just end by saying that it's been a great pleasure and I hope that in the next coming days we'll be able to discuss further in terms of how, you know, I know Brazil has a lot of challenges too and thinking about how, you know, the artists here um, uh, can engage or are engaging in these issues broadly. Thank you. Muito obrigada, Tumelo. Gostaria de dar as boas-vindas a Kalila Brooks Nilsson. Ela irá apresentar o Eu Plural, Raça, Feminilidade e Imagem de Arquivo, 
Kalila é escritora e curadora independente, baseada em Nova York e professora adjunta do Departamento de Fotografia e Imagem da Tisch School of Arts, ligada à New York University. É doutora em Estética e Teoria da Arte pelo Instituto for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts. Nelson obteve seu mestrado em Prática Curatorial pelo California College of the Arts em 2006 e recebeu a bolsa Helena Robstein para estudos de crítica no Programa Independente de Estudos do Whitney Museum entre 2007 e 2008. Ela atua ainda como curadora consultora junto à cidade de Nova York, através da Secretaria de Cultura e do Gracie Mansion Conservancy. Gostaria só de lembrá-los que o, os nossos funcionários do museu estão circulando e estamos recebendo várias perguntas. Se vocês puderem continuar nos mandando, vai ser muito, muito bom para o diálogo final. Kalila, por favor. Obrigada. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you all uh, today and for the duration of this symposium. I'd like to thank Andre and the organizers of this symposium for inviting me to be part of the discussion. And I look forward to the conversations that, that come out of uh, this uh, gathering of minds and images here uh, over the course of this couple of days. So I just want to take this opportunity to give you a bit of background on my research. Um, as was stated earlier, I am an independent curator based in New York City. And I've spent a, a great deal of time writing about and, and thinking about the, the ways that race and gender are performed in media, uh, primarily film, television, and the internet. And so I took this invitation uh, as an opportunity to indulge a bit and to think through uh, the way that women artists, uh, women artists of color, black women artists, are using uh, still or two-dimensional archival images to start to put forward new possibilities or new propositions for the way that race and gender is performed. Um, and I'm really interested in the way that the, the, the pictorial fields that they create and the spaces that they create become propositions for new ways that uh, we can begin as citizens to interact and engage with each other um, and, and, and more fruitful, productive ways that are really critical of uh, how we've been prescribed to perform in society based on traditional race and gender roles. So the title of my presentation is uh, The Plurality of Self, Race, Femininity, and the Archival Image. And I list them out here as these kind of linear elements, but I'm really interested in the way that these things become a mashup, how, you know, they, they uh, start to become indistinguishable. And uh, the way that this indistinguishability is actually um, uh, a zone for productivity, a zone to think through the way that uh, we can develop new identity positions within society. And I think I do this. Yes, okay. So uh, these are the artists that I'm focusing on for this presentation. And I'm going to try to use the pointer. So uh, this artist's name is Kiana Mestrick. Uh, next to her is Sadie Barnett. And at the bottom here is Rosanna Paulino. I bring these three artists together because I'm interested in thinking through out loud here with you today the nuances each use to assert the presence of femininity as a language by which to intervene in the narratives of history. These historical narratives fluctuate between the micro and the macro, the systemic historical record and personal histories. So there is a sense with which 
each of these artists, oh, I'm sorry, there, there is a sense with each of these artists of a reclaiming of their own selfhood or personal identity by bringing forward and disrupting the perception of truth in the quote unquote official record. Let me take a quick aside to clarify a couple of terms that I'm using here. I'm speaking about race in terms of blackness and the critical engagement with the condition of being black that is rooted in the African diaspora. I also take Wikipedia's definition of femininity, notated as a set of attributes, behaviors, and roles generally associated with girls and women. And this is the baseline for this analysis, which will eventually be chipped away at. And the archival image shows up here as photographs and documents that are employed to tell particular stories. You will notice in certain places that text becomes image and image becomes text. So what you will see with Paulino, Mestrick, and Barnett, you will see that they are concerned with subverting the, quote, roles generally associated with women and girls, end quote and diminishing the neatly packaged social binaries, as well as the documents that support those binaries so that race, the feminine, and the archival image become an abstracted dimension for other imaginaries to emerge. So just by show of hands, how many of you are already familiar with Rosanna Paulino's work? Okay. Yeah, I mean, she's a homegirl, so um, I, I know that I'm, I'm dealing with an audience that knows more about her work than I do, but I wanted to bring her into this presentation because I think that her practice is really foundational to the other two artists that I'm going to be presenting. Um, for those of you who don't already know, uh, Paulino is an artist, researcher, and educator that lives and works in Sao Paulo. Her practice consists of photography, printmaking, drawing, sculpture, and multimedia installation. She describes her practice as, quote, linked to social, ethnic, and gender issues. Her main focus is on the black woman's position in Brazilian society and the various types of violence suffered by this population due to racism and the legacy of slavery, end quote. The images I'm showing are from her project entitled A Sentimento from uh, 2013. For this project, Paulino appropriates images from Louis Agassiz's Thayer expedition in Brazil. Agassiz is a Swiss-born zoologist and Harvard professor that used photography in the mid-1800s as a means of validating through what he considered to be scientific observation the enslaved body as an inferior race. It was his intention to collect data with which to prove the superiority of the white ethnic group over others. Aiming to prove his racist theories, Agassiz commissioned Augusto Stahl to produce a series of photographs like the ones you see here. Um, of Africans and Chinese living in Rio de Janeiro between the years of 1865 and 1866. The idea was to portray, quote, pure racial types, and so the images had to take on a scientific character where the people would appear in three different positions, as you can see here, from the front, from the back, and in profile. The title of Paulino's project, A Sentimento, translates into English as Settlement. Paulino presents the same photographs taken by Stahl, prints them on cloth measuring approximately six feet tall, so life size, and adorns them with sewn interventions and etchings of a fetus in a womb, roots at the feet, and a heart at the chest. 
if originally this image was intended to determine the racial differences serving the objectives to better control and dominate this population, Paulino produces a radical inversion of this discourse in showing the fragmented body whose sutures metaphorically describe the impossibility of being integrally assimilated into the colonial and subsequent post-colonial culture. About this piece, Luana Saturnino Vardovskas wrote, quote, besides producing an acid critique of the violence of slavery, the artist with this installation questions the settlement of African experiences in a Brazilian common ground and the subjective and spiritual reconstruction even when faced with historical violence. So this slide is a detail of a cross section from one of the figures. You get a sense of scale here with the artist's hand in the frame. You also see the crudeness of the sutures, boldly stitched across the reassembled material. The heaviness of the black stitches accentuate the delicate position by which Paulino has appliqued the heart onto the surface, along with the softness of the red string that the artist gently supports with her fingers. Paulino describes her education as, quote, old fashioned, where she was taught to sew. She later took the skills she learned and transgressed the notion of sewing and embroidery as domestic women's work and applied that strategy to making images that address the history of violence against black women. And in this slide, we have an installation view of a sentimento. Um, I believe this installation was here at this museum. I could be wrong. Correct me if I am, Andre. You don't know? OK. <laughs> this image gives you a sense of what the work uh, looks and feels like in space, as well as the other materials that were incorporated into the installation to further illuminate the context in which this body lived. In between the two prints on the floor is a small video of an ocean looking out from the perspective of the shoreline. And next to that on a wood pallet is a bundle, is a bundle made up of wood and sculpted forearms. These elements signify the perilous journey of the transatlantic slave trade and the millions of lives that would have been transformed as well as the position of the black female body within the slaveocracy as natural resources and as disposable or replaceable parts within the mechanism of slavery itself. The idea of a sentimento or settlement, as again it is translated into English, recalls the disjointed process of reassembling one's identity and culture in a new place under authoritarian political, social, and economic conditions. It is not an ideal set of conditions, but Paulino's work makes visible a transgressive feminine aimed at self-transformation and the deconstruction of race's representation of female bodies. So the next artist I wanna present this morning is Kiana Mestrick, akin to the notion of failed assimilation that drives the formal choice in Paulino's work Mestrick is also concerned with the experience of being in between places, outcast, and in this case, unsettled. Mestrick describes the project entitled Hard to Place as a true story about race, family, and the child welfare system in post-war Britain. She combined confidential government documentation, archival and autobiographical photography, to produce a book that illustrated the childhood of Joseph, an orphan boy of Nigerian and Irish parentage, growing up in London in the 1960s and 70s. A half-caste child, in England, Joseph was considered hard to place amongst the mostly white adoptive families. Consequently, Joseph was placed in care at eight different times from the age three to 17. Mestrick's self-funded and published Hard to Place 
in 2016 as a paperback photography book. The book's first spread features a portrait of Joseph's father on the left and his mother on the right. Mestrick admits that she chose the book form to represent the series of images in direct relation to the family album or scrapbook, mediums meant to preserve memories. For many like Joseph, these personal archives are often non-existent or incomplete. The pairing of Joseph's parents stand out as a common type of photograph found in family albums. This coupling evokes what one might see in vernacular photography. So a key point to this narrative that Mestrick is stitching together is that Joseph is Mestrick's husband. She recalls that on their first date together, he nervously told her his life story, continuously pulling at his sleeves to hide the ink of bad decisions made during his teenage years as a black skinhead. The little boy in the color documentary images seen here in Hard to Place is Mestrick and Joseph's son. She used her camera to capture tender, curious, and mundane moments in her home along with some other more emotional family situations. In these images, their son often becomes the precocious yet isolated little boy Mestrick imagines his father was as a child. She began the project in 2013, when under the United Kingdom's Data, Data Protection Act of 1998, her husband Joseph received two legal-sized books stuffed with photocopied files documenting the years he spent as an orphan. In late 2015, Mestrick began pairing her own documentary images with these confidential documents as a means of providing a visual alternative to this official narrative of Joseph's childhood. The documents include type and handwritten, typed and handwritten text authored by social workers observing both Joseph and his mother Maureen, who often needed financial and housing assistance. In some cases, Mestrick leaves the text as is, other times she reworked the text into a poem form to highlight the detached tone and the clinical obser observatory nature of the situation. And I'm gonna to try to read this um, text for you here. It says, will be difficult to arrange adoption because of the baby's color. The archival images show Maureen as a vibrant woman despite the struggle she endured living as a single Irish woman with a black child in a former colonial empire. The use of Mestrick's documentary images as a component of the visual narrative functions to undergird the presence of a mother in the story. The interaction that she composes between the old and new images becomes a vehicle to engage with a mother-in-law that she never knew. In growing to learn more about herself as a mother, Mestrick creates a voice for herself and young child in the mysterious story of her husband's upbringing. The incomplete records, lack of family snapshots, and access to living relatives opened up a space for the artist to derive new meanings from those absences. What was once considered a mark of shame is now a place for healing. At first, at first reading, it appears that the book is about her husband's story, and he is the inspiration for the story. But as one spends time with the images and the design and composition of the book, it becomes apparent that a third text emerges, one that acts as a mythical conduit for the meeting of two mothers. In line with Mestrick's, Mestrick's investigation of family history and narrative structure, Sadie Barnett's installation, Dear 1968, was recently on view at the Cantor Fitzgerald 
gallery at Hat River College in Pennsylvania in the US. It was a reflection on black American radicalism of the late 1960s, but also on her particular relationship to her father, Rodney Barnett, who was one of the founders of the Oakland chapter of the Black Panther Party in 1968. The title of the installation sets up the experience as a correspondence. Notably, the perspective of Barnett as the daughter looking back onto 1968. The fact that her father was in the Black Panthers led her to view history not as an abstract distant past, but rather as an aspect of family history. Some of the work in the installation engages explicitly with COINTELPRO, the FBI surveillance program run by J. Edgar Hoover that often illegally targeted political activists like Barnett's father. She reminds the viewer that history is not just in books and it's not just about the names we remember, but also about the people who actually lived in that moment. This piece that you're looking at here is untitled, Black 1968, uh, graphite on paper. Barnett focuses on the presentation of black families in her work. Her practice pushes up against the people and the policies that subjugate black lives, the kind of institutionally racist sensibilities and actions that spurn the Black Lives Matter movement. She states that being black in America is inherently political because racism still exists. She employs abstraction and temporal distance to complicate the either or framework. framework. She strives to allow viewers to hold oppositions, reframe things, and imagine a radically different set of principles around which to organize a society through her work. These images here are from almost 50 years ago, and they feature the elder Barnett, her father, Rodney, dressed in, uniform, dressed in the uniform of the US Army before he was sent to fight in Vietnam, and after, outfitted in the black, pan, in the black turtleneck, black leather jacket, solidarity fist button, and black beret that were the de facto uniform of the Black Panther Party. These works are, entitled, are untitled, Dad, 1966 and 1968, to see prints. Much of Barnett's work is more about a way of seeing things rather than a way of making things. She is showing the audience something that already exists and asking the viewer to look at it in a different way. The glitter and spray paint are two motifs in her work that represent her generation. The glitterscapes, like the one shown here, function as an imaginary space to think about what exists beyond state surveillance. It is the possibility of a liberated space, a visual plane by which to project what that fantasy may look like. Glitter, like the rhinestones and pink graffiti that show up throughout the installation, give a sense of the daughter coming to understand her father's past entanglement with the government and taking back that history as author through the clandestine intelligence and making it accessible to the public. Barnett remarks that her hand in these materials is about the father-daughter relationship and being a daddy's girl looking at the government, looking at her daddy. This work is also entitled Baby Girl, Collage Rhinestones on Holographic Paper and Glitter. This, in this installation, Barnett has on view 28 pages excerpted, excerpted from 500 pages of her father's FBI file. Glitter, pink spray paint, and rhinestones appear on the surface of the files as a form of defiant vandalism, but also as decorative markings that are antithetical to J. Edgar Hoover's agenda. 
The feminine is deployed in Barnett's work to disarm the power that the government once held over her father's life. Her radical femininity here serves to deconstruct the primacy of these documents as they become the surfaces she uses to challenge how we show up for and participate in the democratic process. So I want to end here. I'm ending with, this installa with these installation shots of the exhibition. You can see the custom wallpaper that Barnett has adhered to the walls in the space. This is a glimpse of a black domestic space that honors the familial ties that are caught in the web of state surveillance. As I close, I just want to highlight a few of the broader themes that uh, thread through each of these artists' work in the hopes that this will be part of the conversation that we continue to have here. And they are the abstracted dimension of other imaginaries, visual alternatives to the official narrative, and the creation of third spaces. In my view, these are the elements that necessitate fertile ground for new forms of radical identification in art, representation, and culture as a means of transforming and challenging the status quo. Thank you. Obrigada, Kalia. Nós vamos agora para a última apresentação da manhã com o Neil Lawrence. O Neil irá apresentar a fala retratando e imaginando o corpo negro masculino na Jamaica pós-colonial. O Neil Lawrence é curador sênior da National Gallery of Jamaica e também artista. O Neil possui mestrado em estudos culturais, em filosofia e graduação em literatura inglesa, sociologia e comunicação visual. Seus interesses de pesquisa incluem raça, gênero e sexualidade na arte e na cultura visual diaspórica do Caribe e da África, memória, identidade e arquivos ocultos. Lawrence também atuou como ensaísta para a publicação Pictures from Paradise, a Survey of Contemporary Caribbean Photography. Essa, como essa é a última mesa, é, as perguntas também podem continuar chegando para nós, e depois vamos abrir para a conversa com os palestrantes e o público. Muito obrigada. Bom dia, everyone. <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to thank Maspa for bringing me here and making me a part of what I can already see is going to be a wonderful set of conversations. I especially want to thank um, Andre and Claudia for putting up with my antics. Um, and I would like to offer an apology to my translators for the speed with which I may talk at some times. Um, <laughs> My presentation will focus on the imaging and imagining of the black male body in post-colonial Jamaica. Through, though my presentation is primarily about images and artwork produced in Jamaica after the country became independent of Britain in, on August 6th, 1962, it will necessarily reference works from both the period of enslavement as well as early nationalist works that arguably precipitated the independence of the country. Oh, my body, make of me always a man who questions. I choose to begin with this quote by Fanon for two reasons. One, it eloquently embodied my own perspectives on the body, specifically the black male body, as a repository for societal histories and experiences related to gender, sexuality, and of course, race. And two, because it also put particular emphasis on inquiry, questioning the ideologies that surround these multifaceted identities. Where did it all begin? Um, my interest, fascination with the body began in the gyms of Montego Bay, Jamaica. My father was a championship bodybuilder and my own work as an artist has looked on how identity can be shaped and reshaped by outward appearance. Whether the agency in that respect lies with the person or outside of themselves. I have also been particularly interested in the intersections between race, class, gender, and sexuality in Jamaican society, and how our particular historical contexts have influenced those intersections. 
When I first started working full-time at the National Gallery of Jamaica in 2008, I came across a set of files about Jamaican photographers, which were of special interest to me because I myself a photo am a photographer. Archilindo's file was among them. The file contained two items, a photocopy of a Jamaica Journal article on Lindo by Martin Mordecai from 1989, and a newspaper article on a posthumous exhibition. My attention was originally attracted to the photograph, the Irish Moss Gatherers, an undated image from the mid 20th century that depicts three nude black men standing on a beach. Firstly, because it resonated on several levels with my own work, which at that point utilized nude male iconography. And secondly, because up until that point, I had been totally unaware of the existence of photographs of nude Jamaican male subjects from the mid 20th century or earlier. I was also conflicted by the imagery, since as a black gay photographer living in post-colonial Jamaica, I'm keenly aware of the racial and social dynamics involved in the depiction of the male body, and also the cultural and historical ramifications of the dynamics between the photographer and subject. To properly contextualize this dynamic, it is necessary to look at the historical precedences for the depiction of the black male body, in this case under the default white male gaze. The portrait of Benjamin and Mary Pusey by William Wickstead represents the epitome of power and status in the plantation period. The signifiers of wealth and worldliness, expensive fashionable clothing and furnish furnishings, art and a globe representing travel and experience populate the painting. The gender and racial hierarchy of the period is also present by the dominant central positioning of Benjamin, Benjamin Pusey whose wife is in his orbit with the reticent enslaved black servant the farthest away from the center of power in the background. The image of the slave ship Brooks was widely dispersed across the UK, appearing in newspaper leaflets and even as posters in pubs. The image which served as a how-to manual in the maximizing of, spa of space for the ship's human cargo was mobilized by the abolitionist movement as a groundbreaking piece of propaganda. The history of the rise, progress, and accomplishments of the abolition of the slave trade by the British Parliament, 1808, in the history, sorry, um, Thomas Clarkson wrote that the print seemed to make an instantaneous impression of horror upon all who saw it, and therefore instrumental in consequence of the wide circulation given it in serving the cause of the injured African. Josiah Wedgwood's Am I Not a Brother, depicting a kneeling, pleading blacks, black male was also an image that was widely circulated by abolitionists. While both were mobilized as, abolition, as images that caused significant public outcry regarding atrocity, atrocities sorry, of slavery, they also displayed the black male body as an objectified repository of those atrocities, thus solidifying the prevailing perceptions of the black male. They served as reminders, despite the best intentions of its circulators, of the othered subordinate status of the black male, and by extension, black people in general, in the social and historical context it was created. But returning to the power dynamic presented in the Wickstead painting, and a decidedly post-colonial response to the dynamic inherent in it. Marvin Bartley's 2007 photographic work, Luke Collingswood's Journey, from the Tragedies of Zong series, offers a stunning counterpoint to the, po the body politics inherent in the Wickstead portrait. The infamous maritime tragedy is recontextualized by stripping away the signifiers of wealth and status, representing the slave ship's captain, Luke Collingswood, who, among, who through the central figure in the work, who though the central figure in the work, becomes simply another nude body among the slaves he threw overboard to their deaths. While as Bell Hooks has proposed, camera, cameras gave to black folks irrespective of class, a means by which we could par participate fully in the production of images. This was only the case when the means of photographic production became more democratized in the mid to late 20th and 21st century. Photographs in the colonial peri period were another matter altogether. Anonymous, eroticized, and exoticized in ways that would surely be contentious today, this beautiful image of a young boy was taken at the Cherry Gardens Great House in Kingston, Jamaica. It was created by a famous Scottish photographer whose firm produced images of the early Jamaica, for the early Jamaican tourist industry. The objectification of the subject was a matter of course during this era. Colonial eras, era images of black laborers were generally more anthropological in their focus than their nationalist counterparts. 
An interesting counterpoint to the Valentine image is Albert Huey's The Island, which provides a critical perspective on the contradictory objectification that persisted after the colonial period and well into the period of Jamaica's independence. It poignantly represents the touristic exoticization and exploitation of the island, where here represented by a reclining black male figure who is assaulted by camera-wielding tourists. This image, of course, also spoke to the literal objectification of the black body as well. As part of the decolonizing effort in Jamaica, the cultural nationalists attempted to find new images for Jamaicans, though their legacy of colonialism tended to overshadow their attempts. The nationalist movement, of course, predated Jamaica's independence. Potentially the most iconic representation of the Jamaican nationalist era, Edna Manley's Negro Aroused, mobilizes the nude black male body as a repository for the aspirations of a movement. While this conforms to the traditional European concept of the heroic nude, the black male body is also objectified and exposed to the gaze of the outsider in a potentially problematic way, as it reinscribes some of the racial perceptions it ostensibly seeks to challenge. Cosmo White's Jinal, which in Jamaican Patwa means trickster, more actively challenges normative masculinities. The hyper-masculine image of Ivanhoe Martin from the 1972 Jamaican Badman epic, The Harder They Come, is combined with Anansi, the trickster in Cosmo, Cosmo White's diptych, which thus explores two of the more popular archetypes of male Jamaican behavior, the bad man or rude boy and the trickster, that challenge normative constructs about respectable male leadership. Of note is Laura Face's work, Redemption Song, which has become the de facto emancipation monument. The work uses the same visual vocabulary seen in, Edna, in, in Manley's Negro Aroused, and yet it became the most controversial monument in Jamaican history, largely because it brought the issues of the implied sexual references and objectification to the fore in the public domain. It is of note that much of the discourse in the public domain surrounded, surrounding this statue focused primarily on the nudity of the male figure, though references to the enslaved being sold on auction block also came to the fore, belying a public discomfort with the nude male and acceptance of the nude female. Whoa. Went too fast there. Heroic representation of black labor was another, in this case, well-recognized hallmark of the nationalist movement. The athlete and the worker became accepted tropes of Jamaican identity. The physicality of Edna Manley's shirtless diggers, working in machine-like unison, for instance, multiplies and emphasizes the ideal of the physicality and economic productiv productivity of the black male. One of the unresolved issues with Jamaican nationalist art is its unwavering, and given Jamaica's history of slavery and present-day realities of labor exploitation, surprisingly uncritical celebration of physical labor as a nation-building activity. Albert Hewitt's crop time, for instance, provides a sweeping panorama of modern sugar industry as one of the pillars of the Jamaican economy, but does not even seem to hint at the historical baggage this subject carries. The Jamaican nationalist movement, helmed by, helmed by the lighter-skinned Jamaican elite, mobilized images of the dark-skinned, the darker-skinned black working class to further their ends. Banana Man by Alvin Marriott parallels the vision of Huey's crop time. Banana Man represents a physical ideal that was supposedly the result of working in the fields. There, is also some, there also seems to be strong sexual innuendo in the sculpture, with the suggestive way in which the figure holds the phallic stem of the bunch of bananas. One is left to wonder if the sexual connotations were accidental or deliberate. The men in this image are at once monumental and relatable. The midday sun creating sharp shadows that, mar that mark their bodies, make their bodies almost cutouts in their environment, which adds to the iconic quality of the image. The rough rocky beach emphasizes the primitive battle for survival against the environment. It is an almost timeless image as the only elements that provide hints of dating are the hairstyle and the cigarettes. The image can thus be subjected to multiple readings. It can be homoerotic or simply homosocial. 
it can be representative of a transgressive sexuality or simply be another nostalgic representation of old time Jamaica. Wade Roden is a young Jamaican photographer whose edgy style crosses the boundaries between fine art and fashion photography. Untitled 2013 represents prevailing male body ideals in the fashion industry, which are often as unattainable as the body ideals in female fashion photography. The imagery in this photograph also e exists in an unexpected and provocative dialogue with the heroic idealized body focused depictions of black masculinity of the nationalist school, such as the work of Edna Manley's Negro Arrows and the previous work by Marriott. There is, for instance, a oh, there is, for instance, a curious ambivalence toward the male body, specifically the nude male body by Malika Capo Reynolds, says odd oddly emasculated Copeland boxer. While the boxer figure is robust and looms large over the painting's viewers, this painting is particularly large, um, <laughs> his proportionately small penis goes counter to how masculinity is normally constructed in the popular imagery, imaginary. The diminutive genitals may present, represent an attempt at modesty on the part of the artist, but Capo has been quite uninhibited in his depictions of male and female sexuality in other artworks, and the question arises why the figure is represented in the nude, since this is not a conventional mode of representation for boxers. The vision of the athlete is also hardly celebratory in Barrington Watson's Athlete's Nightmare too, which depicts an uncertain, unresolved, result to a particularly contested run. This haunting image of athletic failure encapsulates the precariousness of masculinity. Style and fashion are important considerations in the construction and expression of gender identities, even though these are often stereotyped as female preoccupations. Sartorial politics are an important part of the discussion regarding the black male body. I've chosen to discuss this circa 1908 image of Jamaican Negroes by Sir Harry Johnson under style and fashion as the black male body and the black was rarely depicted in any other capacity than that of barefooted servitude in colonial art. Interestingly, okay, let me see if I can get the pointer here. An earlier image by the photographic firm of Adolf Duperle and Son shows a different reality. Though the figures in this photograph are arguably placed to give scale to the exotic, amongst the lush vegetation, right here, Ooh. Ah, of Castleton Gardens, a particularly well-dressed black man stands in the center. Self-possessed and assured, he represents the emergence of a black middle class and challenges the demeaning anthropological representations of black masculinity evident in the previous image by Johnston that predated and still persisted during the period. The self-assured defiance found in Osman Watson's Johnny Cool, with his decidedly dark skin and direct gaze. He's cool, collected, and well-dressed, evincing a posture of rude boy confidence but he's also a representation of the burgeoning Caribbean black power movement. Many of Watson's works were meant to encourage a positive self-image among Jamaican's largely black populace. The style and fashion represented in Vermont Howie Grant's dance hall artist are also a mechanism by which masculine hierarchies are maintained. The jewelry of Bounty Killer, it's here, <laughs> um, the tattooed and bleached face of Vibes Cartel, in particular, speak to the ways in which dance hall represents aspirational tendencies, but also challenges the standards of good taste and black self-affirmation of the Jamaican middle class. The fluidity of societally constructed gender roles is also explored in Ebony G. Patterson's video installation, The Observation Bush Cockrell, A Fictitious History. It is at once a critique of the ways in which masculinity is constructed in Jamaica, with the added ambivalence that dance hall culture engenders. The image seen here depicts three members of a fictional birdman species that make up a family unit. Their clothes slash plumage reference the often androgynous and ornate male dance hall fashion, but also suggests a male and female. 
but she has confounded the viewers by having both figures display both male and female characteristics. The choreographed interactions of the two imaginary androgynous bird-human hybrids in relation to each other and their offspring further problematizes the preconceptions surrounding parental gender roles. Gender fluidity becomes an instrument for Marvin Bartley's depiction of dandyism for the 21st century. The willowy beauty and androgyny depicted in this art fashion photograph defies the hyper-masculinity that was a hallmark of nationalist and to some degree the depictions of the worker in the colonial period. Bartley's Icarus expands the concept of male beauty beyond its muscular precedence in Jamaican in in imagery. Jamaican perceptions and attitudes towards masculinity have been informed by social anxieties about the expected roles of men and, most, and the most acute anxieties pertain to the male body and male sexuality. Jamaican concepts of masculinity seem particularly challenged by the varied ways in which typical, the typical male gaze can be reversed. Leisha Johnson's work parodies, questions, and critiques contemporary popular cultures generally accepted expressions of gender normative behavior. The two male cartoon characters in his provocatively titled Me and the Monkey Man Hugging Up from 2013 straddle decidedly phallic images of bananas in a critique of the hypersexuality and homophobia within dance hall. Leisha Johnson uses a purposefully humorous and naughty aesthetic in his work. In an almost subversive way, he breaks the codes of the Jamaican society, but manages most of the time to get away with the transgression because they are so funny. Johnson has recently begun making guerrilla interventions in the urban landscape using similar imagery. Most have remained in some form except the one of the two males embracing the light pole, which was removed almost immediately. The short-lived nature of this intervention illustrates the conversations outside of the binary representation uh, under, under, sorry, let me repeat. The short-lived nature of this intervention illustrates that conversations outside of the binary representations of gender can occur with, with relative safety in the art world, but not in wider Jamaican society. Isaac Mendez Belisario's Cuckoo, or Actor Boy, is, a tra is as transgressive as it is familiar to Jamaicans. The cross-dressing figure challenges both the prevailing socio-racial norms of the plantation era, as well as the hyper-masculine imagery that had been associated with the black male body in depictions of the enslaved and newly emancipated. Actor Boy finds its contemporary counterpart in Vogue by Marlon James, whose more sexually provocative counter-normative gender performance poses a direct challenge to contemporary Jamaica's seemingly unassailable sexual and religious mores. This is potentially the most fraught area in imaging the black male body in post-colonial Jamaica. Returning to and concluding with the most recent work by Leisha Johnson, Land of Big Hood and Water, the title of Leisha Johnson's 27 installation is a sexualized play on the name the Taino gave Jamaica, Zaymaka, land of wood and water. The potentially humorous and decidedly explicit islands floating in the sea draw attention to the way in which the global north looks at the global south. The islands and its inhabitants are exoticized and open for exploitation and consumption, evidenced by the prevalence of sexual tourism in these regions. The figures are also deceptive as they, are at first, as they at first seem to depict a heteronormative gendered binary, but in reality represent the spectrum of queer sexuality. How has the image of the black male changed in post-colonial Jamaica? It is potentially even more multifaceted and complex than ever, incorporating identities that have not always been equitably represented. There is not one singular definition, de definitive image that encompasses the black male body, nor should there be. The colonial and even the Jamaican nationalist movements sought to define the black male body in particular ways. The colonials as subservient, the nationalists as heroic, but where they were both lacking is that they purposely or otherwise failed to paraphrase Michael Buckner's essay, Jamaican Masculinities and Artistic Representation, 
to acknowledge the racialized and patriarchal constructions of masculinity, which artists are now critiquing through the lens of gender and sexuality. Thank you. Bom, eu, temos perguntas individuais para cada para cada um de vocês e temos perguntas para todos. Que eu vou é, a pedido é, da mesa a gente vai fazer uma pergunta por vez. É, algumas perguntas a gente vai eu vou misturar, então me perdoem se algo ficou faltando. Então, vou começar pelo Tomelo Moussaka. Em sua experiência na Carolina do Sul, ao ressignificar espaços de memória da escravidão e do racismo em Charleston, como foi essa relação com a comunidade branca e o grupo supremacistas? Houve reações negativas ou problemas? Eu acho que, sabe, é sempre uma questão de pensar sobre audiências e and also thinking about how you uh, can communicate across differences. So obviously, in terms of thinking about the more radical right-wing uh, you know, audiences, uh, those are not the kind of people that I think would be interested in what I'm doing, and, uh, but I would like to be in conversation with them. And so I think for the most part, it was for me to try to feel that I'm creating a platform for anybody to engage. And in some instances, yes, we did get some resistance where um, you know, people would say very um, negative things and, um, and sometimes the artwork was also vandalized. I mean, I think when you work in this kind of territory, I, I think you become aware that you know, it's, 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 it's an open field and anything is possible. And when you're dealing with histories that are um, not visible, Uh, and, and, the, and, and you were dealing with public spaces, I think you're prone to uh, you know, some negative responses. And so I think we, you know, in the back of our minds, we, ha we, we were aware that this was a territory that would um, create some contention, but the idea is that the contention would become a conversational point, you know, and hopefully through that conversation then begin to You know, I think just to, to create an awareness about how the landscape is constructed and how society has created certain um, levels of interaction that are limited for some people. Uma das, uma das perguntas aqui foi para a Kalia. Gostaria de te ouvir falar sobre a receptividade do trabalho dessas artistas mulheres e negras no seu país. O forte histórico do movimento negro e feminista no seu país informa e influencia as políticas culturais e institucionais nas suas bases? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, there, there is a history of a black feminist movement. And um, in terms of its effect on influencing policy, um, from sort of a governmental level, um, I uh, don't know how effective that that's been. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen any particular evidence of that um, in terms of uh, the, the you know, political, um, any kinds of you know, legislate, legislation and things like this, but I think that um, the black feminist movement has been increasingly influential, um, definitely on a practice Uh, like myself, uh, black women have been incredibly influ influential, even in terms of my interest in contemporary art, in the history of art, um, in the language that I bring to uh, my explorations in art. Um, and I've been um, incredibly fortunate to uh, be able to have those interactions with uh, black women artists who come from a generation before me. Um, that generation has really laid the groundwork for um, the, the kind of work that's going on now with young black women artists um, and uh, has you know, already you know, started that work of uh, breaking down the sort of traditional uh, hyper-masculine um, 
uh, communities that exist uh, in the cultural culture overall, overall in the United States, but also within the uh, communities of art as well. Obrigada, Kalia. Tem mais uma pergunta que acabou de chegar para você também. Vou fazer é sobre o trabalho de Sadi, Sadi Barnett. Até que ponto a interferência artística sobre documentos secretos pode humanizar? Acho que é isso está escrito. Uma história tão violenta. Acho que essa é uma pergunta importante também é, quando a gente traz o tema do corpo, né, para falar de história. E, e se você puder um pouquinho comentar sobre isso. Ok, so uh, just clarify again for me the question. Sim. É, sobre o trabalho de Sadie Barnett, até que ponto a interferência artística sobre documentos que são tidos como secretos, né, são documentos do Estado, me parece, pode tornar de uma, pode trazer uma esfera humana para uma história tão violenta? Pode, é como colocar o corpo, pelo que eu entendi da pergunta, é, como colocar o corpo em, em contraste com uma história que é tão impessoal, é algo estatal, assim, quase. Pelo que, eu, pelo que eu entendi. I, in my opinion, it's the the artist's access to receiving this information um, that begins to humanize the experience of that kind of abstracted body under governmental surveillance, and the act of reclaiming that information and um, marking that information up. Um, you know, sort of, the artist is engaged in her own unique type of redaction, of removing information, but also in this additive kind of activity of um, uh, adorning this information as well. And uh, it, it has this way of disarming the, the original intention of those documents, um, but then also has a way of making it relevant again in a contemporary context, um, and humanizing it in that way. So when uh, you know her glitter and the pink spray paint and the rhinestones, all of those are evidence of her hand on this material. Um, and you know she talks about the experience of that work being on view and of her father's reception of that work being on view, and how that kind of letting go of all that hidden documentation is a liberatory practice. Um, it is a way of him being emancipated from that kind of um, state-sanctioned surveillance that he was under for so long that had a direct effect on, on his life and his ability to, to take care of his family. Obrigada. Tenho três perguntas para o Neil. Eu vou fazer, se que eu faça as três na sequência, você me diz. Se, se, se precisar repetir, tá? Uh, para o Neil, o pens uh, para, para você. O pensamento de Marcos Govery influenciou em que sentido a masculinidade, ma as masculinidades negras na Jamaica? A segunda pergunta é. Wait, sorry, did you, Marcos Garvey? Ok. Isso. Ah. Prefere que eu faça outra em seguida? Ok. Uh, Uniu aqui em São Paulo, ouço o discurso masculinidades há pouquíssimo tempo. Sei que no Caribe há muitas referências para o debate decolonial e precisamos descolonizar também os corpos. Você encontra interlocução, interlocuções nesse debate? Como ele acontece no seu contexto? E a última pergunta é... Estamos enf enfrentando no Brasil diversas reações conservadoras contra exposições que abordam sexualidade. Como são as respostas do público aos trabalhos que você apresentou e que abordam sexualidade e gênero? Em um, Jamaica, uh, Marcus Garvey é uma figura complexa. A coisa é que ele era... Eu quero dizer... Ele se tornou um nacional, um emblem, um nacional hero well after his work internationally, when he came home to Jamaica. Um, initially, his influence, was, his influence in Jamaica was great um, in terms of the 
push for black pride, black power, um, black agency. And by black agency, I mean things like the right to vote, the right to find beauty in, your, in yourself. Um, his, his vision, though, was a little bit rigid, to be perfectly honest, but it, it was a, a circumstance of the time, a, 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 of that time period in Jamaica's history in terms of his relationship to um, the lighter skinned the Jamaicans and um, white Jamaicans, his relationship to women. Those things today may be seen to be a little bit archaic um, by perspective, but overall, I think Marcus Garvey has been seen as a symbol of pride by most black nationalists, by the Rastafari movement, in that he has come to show what a black man can do in, if, if he is unfettered by um, you know, what, whatever societal structures there might be. So in terms of the, the, the definition and the, 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 of black masculinity, he was a very important figure, but for in some cases it was for, as a transgressive figure. Um, the second question, no, I, I'm sorry, I need you to, I'm not gonna take them all at once because I'm not remembering them, they're good questions. <laughs> Uma das perguntas era sobre como é, a, os espaços de debate sobre decolonidade de se dão no Caribe, é, porque aqui no Brasil a gente tem é, essa é uma discussão que está aos poucos tomando uma certa popularidade, é, principalmente o termo masculinidades, né? É, então é uma pergunta para entender como essa discussão acontece no seu contexto e a outra era sobre a recepção a recepção das é, de críticas, né, em relação a this one first, sorry. Ah, okay. Tá. Yeah, yeah, because I'll forget again. Um, <laughs> um, in terms of decolonizing the black body, that has been uh, it's been a very important part of post-colonial, but also. Um, post-independence, which was in 1962, post-independence Jamaican imagery and um, conversations. The thing is with the artists like Barrington Watson that I had shown with um, the athlete's nightmare, that figure, with the, the, the image with the, with the athletes running that painting, a lot of the decolonization or the attempts at decolonization were really towards a redefinition that was being done by, by black artists for, about black art. So the thing is, we had attempts at decolonization with works by artists like Edna Manley, but that was, um, that was a bit problematized by the fact that Edna Manley was a lighter skinned Jamaican. So she was working against the, the colonial powers, but there was a bit of discomfort from artists later on about her own social position speaking about the black body. So artists like Barrington Watson began speaking about um, Barrington Watson, Eugene Hyde, who's unfortunately I didn't show his work. Um, they, 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 they sought to redefine the black body, um, decolonize, if you will, it on their own terms. So that is what the difference was. Um, now, um, in con contemporary art, we, I mean, artists like um, Marvin Bartley, um, Ebony G. Patterson, or so on, the process continues, but with, um, the, the, the conversation, I should say, continues between the, the precedents, the works that existed before, but the, the focus is n not as much on the literal decolonization. Um, de well, depending on how you define decolonization, because, I mean, the colonial period puts a particular set of strictures in Jamaica um, that are still present today in terms of race, class, sexuality, etc. So in, in a way, they, their work is now pushing forward the agenda to contemporary concerns. All right. Obrigada. É, tenho aqui uma pergunta para... And the last question. Ah, a última, per... last question a última pergunta about... foi sobre a recepção desses temas, porque acho que é, acho que é uma pergunta que tem sido recorrente aqui em todos os, para todos os palestrantes, principalmente por conta do contexto em que nós estamos vivendo, de algumas reações a exposições 
é, que tratam sobre questões de gênero e sexualidade, reações muito diversas e, muito, às vezes, muito agressivas. Né? Então, é, acho que essa é uma pergunta, uma curiosidade também nossa, como isso é recebido pelo, pelo grande público, assim, que questões muito ligadas à sexualidade. Um, sexuality is a very tense topic in Jamaica. Um, Jamaica, um, it's very complicated. I mean, Jamaica has a reputation for being a particularly homophobic society. Um, the thing is, there are always exceptions to these generalizations of, of any country. And the thing is, with um, the reception of works that, that challenge race, class, gender, sexuality, but particularly sexuality, the reception is, is varied depending on the nature of the work. Um, female sexuality, um, or I should say heteronormative sexuality, is something that is generally accepted. Um, anything that goes beyond the heteronormative is um, potentially problematized, but then it also depends on the space and the environment. As I referred in my presentation, if these conversations take place in an institutional context, say an art museum, an art gallery, there tends to be greater acceptance for the conversation and for the interventions into the awareness, but if it moves outside of the art space, because the art space in Jamaica tends to be a safe space for most discussions, um, it, when it moves outside of that realm, however, into the public domain, that is when it, become, it, it can become very problematic because we are still a conservative um, for all our dance hall antics are, are, are a religious society. And those social mores are very strong within Jamaica. Even though we have, say, a high murder rate, um, there are issues with children living on the street or so on. The thing that gets people mobilized, ironically, to protest, to march on certain things, are issues relating to homosexuality, um, transgender um, rights, etc. So, in terms of reception, the reception really depends on the space. Muito obrigada. E agora, para finalizar, uma é, uma pergunta para Moussaka. Na verdade, duas. E uma delas é, e esse é também, acho que todos podem um pouco se, se sentir à vontade de comentar sobre representação. É, Moussaka, uma das perguntas aqui. É, como, essas, como obras que ocupam espaços afetados pela gentrificação é, não são uma forma de ocupação é, externa, uma, uma forma de ocupação da elite, por exemplo, desses espaços? Uma pergunta que surgiu aqui. É, através, a, através da presença de obras legitimadas pelo sistema de arte, e, eu, e essa é uma das perguntas que apareceu. É, outra pergunta é como a arte pode ajudar a repensar a história, no sentido em que você falou sobre os monumentos né, na cidade. Então, será que você poderia falar mais sobre o papel destes símbolos, marcas, na cidade, e como eles, po eles podem alimentar um imaginário sobre o passado, mas também sobre o futuro dessa comunidade, onde esse monumento se insere? Como, esse, como essas marcas é, na cidade desses lugares históricos podem também trabalhar para criar esse imaginário de uma história diferente, uma, uma possível uma possível mudança é, nesse nesse contexto. Thank you. Um, well, the first question. Um, I, I, I think what is important to, to to realize, or at least to engage, is you know that yes, it's true that in, in in places where spaces are being gentrified, the question is always to engage with the artist, to understand the artist's language, in terms of their intention, but also in terms of how they are relating to the to the location and the politics of the space. So for me, it's it's never about it's always about trying to understand. Um, how the artists, you know, relate, work, or engage with the particular context, and sometimes these these relationships are 
uh, um, you know, involve spending time, you know, whether it be um, researching or whether it be uh, observing is another way of research. But it, it, it is about how, what kind of political stake is, 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 is there for the artist and also for the institution being me who's working with the artist. You know, what is at stake? And obviously there's a lot of political, um, I'm sorry, I'm hearing another voice in my head. Um, the, there's obviously the, the, the political ramifications that are, uh, one has to consider when you, when you begin to engage these very um, uh, emotive spaces. And so one has always got to understand the, the, the visual language that is being um, um, actualized in the space because sometimes, you know, you, you sometimes you have to go gorilla and say, look, we're gonna get arrested if we do this, but I'm gonna look the other way while you do your thing and then we see what happens. And sometimes because the projects are so involved, then you have to involve the system, which is the city. You know, in the projects I showed you, these are projects that I have to then engage with the city to get the rights to use the land. And, and in that process, you have to then educate the, bureaucracy, the, the bureaucratic individuals that are involved, you know, because they want to know why you want to do this project here. Why don't you go over there? And so it's a, it's a, it's a process of education, uh, you know, working with the city uh, bureaucrats to make them understand that no, you want to work there and why it is important because it's not only just about the statement but then you also have to it's almost like you speak many languages so you're always translating you know when you're talking to the uh, city government officials you're speaking one language when you're talking to the press is another language and when you're talking to um, the, the local people is a different language but in each one these elements of truth because I think at the end of the day, if you know what you're doing, you know, the goal is to achieve the project. And you have to do what it takes to achieve the project. So this is why you have to wear these multiple hats because in, if you only speak one language, you might not get through to the government officials because they'll say, well, why should we allow you to do that? Because this project's gonna bring troubles for us, why? So you change your language. You know, you don't talk about gentrification, you don't talk about certain things, but you know they're implicated in the work. You know, so you have to talk about how you're gonna beautify the city, how it is important to have art in the public and make it look nice and, 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 and all this. So I think it's different levels of communication. It's different ways of addressing different publics, you know, in the process of making the work. I think this is also, uh, for me at least, this is part of the process. Sometimes it becomes part of the work of art, depending on which artist you work with. Um, and so I, I think as a curator, you begin to walk these different paths and try to understand which way you need to lean in order to, to, to make the art possible and accessible to the public. And the, the, the other question, which is um, this. Foi uma pergunta sobre uh, inter, sobre monumentos, né, na cidade. Como eles poderiam, uh, como intervenções nesses lugares de memória e história poderiam uh, ajudar a criar um imaginário tanto sobre o passado quanto sobre um futuro a ser construído. Um, it's it's. You know, monuments is a very, it's a big word, it's a big M, because yes, you, you are dealing with, um, you're dealing with the, the, the narrative of a nation or a city or um, a culture. And I think it is to think about how we can begin to decolonize or de-emphasize um, the big H of history. And this, I think, for me, is, is about gestures. How do you create gestures that begin to, to uh, reorient our view of history? It's not about creating more monuments, but it's about really intervening and, and introducing new ideas about how we could reimagine these spaces and monuments. So for me, it's not about creating another different kind of monument from the head to the toe, because you really are duplicating the same system, but it's about really intervening and trying to think differently about 
how we can commemorate our past. Because I think, you know, when you look at history, I think every country has gone through it uh, pretty much in terms of how we want to create these nationalistic um, statements about a, a particular history, which represents a particular people, uh, but not everybody's included in that history. Uh, and how do we then begin to uh, make an intervention to allude to those other histories? And sometimes it's not really about trying to recreate those monuments elsewhere, but it's really to try to sort of create new gestures, you know, new gestures that are, that are rooted in the particular context in terms of its politics and cultural history. What are those, what are those gestures that, that don't have to, that, that don't respond in, in terms of the, um, in terms of the um, vocabulary to how we can begin to commemorate and memorialize uh, different cultures and histories. Uh, I think this is why sometimes, you know, I come from a culture where oral history is, is a very important part of, uh, uh, of daily life. How is that oral history memorialized? And how, how can we memorialize it? And sometimes it's not about trying to capture it, but it's about allowing it to live. How can we give it new life? You know, it's not about trying to capture it on tape and put it in the archive. What kind of archives can we create that are not all about objects that need to be canonized and put in these institutions, you know. How is my grandmother's history and narrative commemorated, you know. But I have to do the job of that commemorating, you know, so which means that I have to then find ways of thinking about how do I transfer this history and knowledge to the new generation, you know, in ways that obviously changes because I will insert my interpretation of that history. And so it differs from generation to generation. But those are the gestures I'm interested in rather than more monolithic, more, um, you know, history. I think the more we see uh, these, these, these gestures, what I call gestures, is I think the more we begin to move away and we begin to think differently and write differently about who we are and what we, and what we experience in life. I think terms like gentrified spaces, um, I mean, with coming from different contexts, I'm not really, if you want to use the term the way it's generally framed, I'm not, the irony is that I'm not really aware of many gentrified spaces in Jamaica because once an area has, uh, the, the fortunes of a particular area have changed, whether due to crime or violence or just general economic shifts, it usually, as far as I have seen so far, it usually stays that way. Um, so the area, I, I've, I've not seen areas bounce back in terms of, you know, like, you know, people moving back in to re-engage with it. I mean, downtown Kingston is a particularly problematic area in that, in that way because a lot of it is abandoned, literally. Um, so there are a lot of empty buildings around downtown Kingston, which used to be a very vibrant economic space where people lived, um, businesses were thriving, and so on. I have seen, however, some artists who have been trying, if, by, if, if we want to think about gentrification as to make the space better, then who have been doing a lot of work on abandoned buildings and murals, especially in communities. There's an initiative um, by the name of Paint Jamaica that goes into a lot of these neighborhoods that are essentially warring factions, where there's a lot of gun violence, children dying, people dying a lot, and try to create safe spaces for them within their, with, with the artwork. So they've made spaces where people can engage in community activities, meetings, um, and from varying, re varying factions can go there and feel that they are comfortable there. They have everything from sports activities to yoga. Um, we've even, um, the National Gallery has even had programs there with the children. So just that ungentrified spaces in, in the Jamaican context. Um, in terms of art and even monuments making us rethink history, um, and new imagery. There was an image I showed, even though I know I showed a whole lot of images. Um, um, the Laura Facey image called Redemption Song with the two people standing and facing each other. That statue, I mentioned that it was very controversial because of particular things with the nudity. But what was really important in terms of rethinking history was that the controversy 
began a conversation. The controversy, people were talking about the nudity, they were talking about everything from the man's genitalia, and for the record, the statue is huge. So when you're looking on the statue, if you're standing in front of it, you are um, hip height to the statue as an average height person. So you're literally at that height where you're, liter you're looking on the genitals. Um, people started conversations about nudity, about slavery, about depictions of slavery, about how this, this, this uncomfortable this, this statue made them. And what it brought to the fore was that we as Jamaicans had not been having active conversations about our history of slavery. Our education system tends to try and kind of minimize the engagement with that topic because it's felt that slavery is something that should be, um, and this is not, a, not, not, not for the record, this is not an official statement by our education system, but I've noted that as I have seen progressive um, students coming to say the National Gallery, that they seem to know less and less about our history of slavery. They know that we were once enslaved as a people. Um, but they don't know a lot of details. So when we begin teaching them the limited amount that we knew, we learned, say, in high school, it's all new information for a lot of them. And a work like the Laura Facey Monument, which had many controversies surrounding the artist's identity as a white Jamaican depicting a black history and so on, it began making people engage again with a topic that had not been spoken about in our country. So it kind of began to make the continuum that is our history and our art, a reality for a lot of Jamaicans when a lot of people are so busy looking forward, they fail to look back and acknowledge what has happened before. I just want to make a couple of points that I think are really important about this uh, question of gentrification and monuments. Um, I think one of the ways that I do a lot of work as a curator, um, a lot of site responsive work, and um, you know that involves translating artist projects in spaces where art traditionally hasn't been seen, and a lot of that having to do in public spaces or creating a kind of publicity or public access to work uh, beyond traditional spaces where you view art. And I think that um, what's important about gentrification is, is little talked about is the role of the artist in gentrification and the way that, we're, that the artist is oftentimes, and also curators as well, but I think um, just from the perspective of looking at artists, um, the way that the artist is co-opted into that process, meaning oftentimes young artists go to places and neighborhoods and cities where they can afford to live and work. And um, over time, cumulatively, as uh, artists move into neighborhoods and spaces, you think about Brooklyn, New York, you think about Oakland, California, um, Detroit, Michigan, uh, through a cumul cumulative process, they then become very um, attractive to new forms of economic investment and, and then spurns this process of gentrification whereby displacement and dis disenfranchisement of the community and residents of the neighborhood who already lived and existed there for many generations, uh, uh, you know, start to be inflicted with. And um, I think that that problematic notion of gentrification from the, uh, you know, the, the perspective of the artist and how you know, artists are uh, used in that process, in that economic process, is a conversation that is rarely had, but I think one that's very important to, to thinking about the way that neighborhoods are being revitalized. Um, and about monuments, of course, this notion of monuments is something that's happening right now in the United States and has really taken on just an incredible uh, momentum in thinking about, you know, you know, what are these colonial and uh, civil war monuments and how do they function in society and what do they tell us about our history? Um, and do something uh, very close to what O'Neill is saying in that it gets people thinking critically um, about what story these monuments are telling and when these monuments were erected and particularly to Civil War monuments. You know, these aren't, 
statues that came about directly after the Civil War. These are statues that became, you know, erected during Reconstruction and during the 1950s when there was great mobilization um, of people of color, black people in particular, women, Native American, Mexican Americans, um, about civil rights and representation. And so this project of monumentalizing uh, uh, Civil War heroes is really a form of cultural intimidation. And I think that, you know, just sort of pulling from what Tumelo said, I think that um, it's really opportunity to challenge this idea of permanence, that the monument has to be this thing that kind of uh, exists forever and is this stable interpretation of, of what history is. And that now that there are these conversations happening and the action of physically tearing down monuments happening, uh, there, it now opens up a space for other people to feel like they can be a part of the conversation of history. And of course, once you start to open up those spaces, then what the potential for revolu revolutionary acts, I think, is, you know, it, it's just, it's bound to happen. Muito obrigada a todos pelas respostas e pelas apresentações de hoje. É, a gente vai encerrar a primeira parte do seminário do dia e gostaria de convidá-los para a segunda parte da tarde, começa às 14 horas, com Ayrson Heráclito, Reginaldo Prandi e Evelyn Sint Nicolás. É, muito obrigada pelas perguntas. Acho que o debate pode continuar lá fora. Nós tivemos que fazer uma pequena seleção de perguntas porque recebemos muitas. E eu gostaria de agradecer a vocês e convidá-los para continuar no seminário hoje e amanhã. Muito obrigada.